Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to our community town hall. My name is Nancy Izzo Jackson, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for India in the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs at the Department of State. It is a pleasure to speak with you today alongside Deputy Assistant Secretary Julie Stuft and USCIS Senior Advisor Doug Rand. President Biden and Secretary Blinken call our relationship with India one of our most consequential global relationships. Our bilateral partnership cuts across our most crucial global strategic priorities from defense, economic and trade, security, health, space, critical emerging technology, and our ever-growing people-to-people ties. Reflecting the importance of this relationship, last week the White House formally announced the official state visit of Prime Minister Modi to Washington, D.C. on June 22nd. During this visit, our leaders will affirm the warm bonds of family and friendship that link Americans and Indians together. We were also thrilled that Ambassador Eric Garcetti officially presented his credentials to President Murmu in Delhi last week and is off to a running start. Those of us working on India have our hands full keeping up with the scope and pace of our bilateral relationship. Recently, I had the pleasure of joining the India Summit on Capitol Hill where I met with many leaders of the Indian American community from across the U.S. In visits to Silicon Valley and San Antonio, I have also heard from hundreds of community and business leaders and participated in the largest U.S. city-sanctioned Diwali Festival in San Antonio. Just last week, our Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs, Don Liu, traveled to Chicago to meet with entrepreneurs and Indian American alumni from the esteemed Indian Institutes for Technology. In all of these interactions, we heard your concerns about the challenges the visa situation has placed on your families and businesses, and appreciate your ideas, support, and patience as we have worked hard over the past year to find solutions. We understand that consular services are vital to our bilateral ties. Hundreds of millions of Indians have family and friends here in the United States. Smooth consular processes help facilitate travel, immigration, and work for citizens from both our countries. I have seen firsthand as DAS for India that people-to-people -people ties are the engine that drive our relationship, and I continue to be amazed by the connection between our two countries, our people, and our private sectors. A few weeks ago, we held the U.S.-India Consular Dialogue, where we discussed the full spectrum of the consular relationship, including visas. We were thankful to receive a strong delegation from the Indian government and had productive conversations with both sides committing to expanding our consular relationship. These strong people-to-people -people ties are one of the reasons we have seen a very high demand across all visa categories following the pandemic. As part of our efforts to address this demand, U.S. Consulate Hyderabad just inaugurated a brand new consular facility. I was in Hyderabad last week and I am incredibly impressed and excited about the consulate's newly expanded consular capacity. Consulate Hyderabad now has 54 interview windows for visa and U.S. citizen services. While it will take time to staff up to full capacity, this new facility will help us respond to the growing demand for travel to the United States and is a visible sign of our investment in and commitment to the U.S.-India relationship. In addition to our new facility, the State Department has dedicated personnel and resources to bring down wait times, including by expanding remote processing, establishing Indian visa lines in Bangkok and Frankfurt, and allowing interview waivers for certain visa categories. We are proud that all wait times for all visa categories, except first-time tourist and business visas, are back to or below pre-pandemic levels. Please be assured that the State Department remains committed to facilitating legitimate travel to the United States for both immigrant and non-immigrant travelers. Ambassador Garcetti, other key government stakeholders, and I remain committed to addressing your concerns and bringing down the wait time in all categories. I hope the past few months have shown how our two countries can make significant progress when working together. It is now my pleasure to introduce Consular Affairs Deputy Assistant Secretary Julie Stuft, who will speak about the extensive work to facilitate travel between our two countries. 
I look forward to our discussion following her comments. Thank you. Over to you, Julie. Thank you, Nancy, for your introduction, and thanks to all of you who are joining us. It's my pleasure to speak with you today. I want to emphasize one point that Nancy made, that the relationship between the United States and India is special, and the high level of travel between our countries, travel by students, workers, and by visitors, rightly reflects this important relationship. We are seeing record demand for all types of U.S. visas, and we will continue to bring down wait times for vi visitor visa interviews, just as we have for all other categories and for all visa renewals. Just this year so far, our embassy and consulates in India have issued an astounding 50% more visas than in the same period in the year before the pandemic. There's no other country in the world where that's happening. Let me tell you what we're doing and what we have done to reduce visa interview wait times. First, we are creating new positions to increase visa processing capacity. We are transferring interview waiver visa cases using digital connections so that consular officers at other overseas posts and in Washington can process visa cases for our embassy and consulates in India. We've opened up offices, as Nancy said, in places like Bangkok and Frankfurt to take Indian visa applications quickly for applicants who are traveling outside of India. We waived visa interviews for certain students and workers with approved petitions. More than 30,000 Indians have benefited from this policy. We will soon begin a program to allow certain visa holders to renew their visas without leaving the United States. The pilot will include visas issued in India, and we will accept initial applications before the end of this year. This is a huge benefit for Indian citizens living and working in the United States, and we are very excited about it. I do want to mention students in particular. India is the second largest country of origin for international students in the United States. And last year, we broke the all-time record for most student visas issued, over 125,000 to Indian students. We may break a new record again this summer, as Mission India is expanding the number of student visa slots this summer. The efforts I mentioned have already had major positive impacts, and we have reduced the wait times for nearly all visa types and renewals to just days. The longest wait times, as Nancy said, are for visitor visa interviews, and even those have dropped 60% since December. They will continue to drop, as we manage this pandemic-related surge of applicants who've been waiting to travel. Thank you very much for listening, and now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and senior advisor to the Director of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Doug Rand, who will speak about the great work USCIS is doing to address immigration issues affecting Indian communities. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Doug Ran. I serve as a senior advisor to the director of USCIS, or MJADU. Uh, I wanted to uh, compliment the, uh, the remarks of my Department of State colleagues, talk a little bit about um, US Citizenship and Immigration Services and what we're doing uh, to uh, make the immigration system more efficient and provide better service, including to um, to uh, individuals coming from India or uh, who are already here uh, making a life in the United States. So uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, as you may know, is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Our primary job is immigration and naturalization services for individuals and sometimes companies or other organizations here in the United States. The State Department, with its many, many embassies and consulates around the world, is in charge of visa services. In other words, getting permission to travel to the United States among other things. So obviously we collaborate very closely um, and, uh, and, and just want to express my appreciation again for being here today. Um, USCIS has an extraordinarily important mission to uphold America's promise as a nation of welcome and possibility with fairness, integrity, and respect for all we serve. Uh, to that end, I'd like to highlight some of the progress USCIS has made uh, over the past couple of years, as well as the challenges uh, we face as we continue uh, to pursue that important mission. So let me let me uh, uh, set the table with how we started. Uh, the Biden administration inherited an agency with depleted funds and growing backlogs across the board. As a overwhelmingly fee funded agency, USCIS had long targeted $1 billion as a safe cash reserve level, but those reserves have decreased to uh, well below $200 million by February of 2020. Then came the COVID-19 pandemic in March, 2020 
Our offices closed for a few months and revenue plummeted. Facing low cash reserves and a possible inability to make payroll, the agency initiated a hiring freeze and issued furlough notices to 70% of its workforce. Fortunately, revenue did begin to rebound and those furlough notices were revoked. Um, but that hiring freeze, which ran for nearly a year, led to an immediate and steep reduction in the number of USCIS officers. Um, uh, and these are employees who left the agency, uh, some of them, and couldn't be replaced easily. So uh, our adjudication capacity was also severely impaired by $500 million in budget cuts. Um, so as a result, total USCIS backlog of overdue cases did skyrocket. So now uh, fast forward uh, from that, that uh, crisis moment to January, 2021, when this administration started, we even had a front log of over 1 million unopened applications and petitions, plus a biometrics appointment queue of 1.4 million people. Now let's talk about how it's going. Uh, in the first months of the Biden administration, USCIS lifted that hiring freeze and began the lengthy process of recruiting and hiring back to our full authorized levels. We've returned to a firm fiscal footing with cash reserves well on the way of the designated target level so that we can ensure the agency avoids another fiscal crisis now or in the future. Uh, I'm glad to say that in early 2022, uh, we were able to stop the growth of that net backlog through an ongoing hiring surge and our continuing drive to find new efficiencies. And now the backlog is on its way down. The dedicated workforce of USCIS is turning the tide on our pending caseload, even while bolstering government-wide emergent efforts such as Operation Allies Welcome and Uniting for Ukraine. Now, I want to recognize we understand the backlogs remain a challenge with real-life impacts. Um, so uh, at the same time, I, I, I give you an overview of some of the real progress we've made. Uh, please know that we, 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 uh, we acknowledge there is still a lot of work to do. Um, but just a few examples of the progress we've made. Uh, you know, we started uh, two years ago where the median uh, processing time uh, for uh, uh, a work permit for an H-4 spouse of an H-1B worker was 7.7 months. Now it's less than three months. Um, and uh, and uh, for, um, for the I-140, which is a petition uh, for permanent residency for uh, an employment-based uh, green card, uh, that uh, processing time median was uh, hovering around eight or nine months. Now it's uh, under four months. Um, just a few examples. Another uh, important accomplishment for this community uh, was uh, last fiscal year when we were in this unique situation when it came to employment-based immigrant visas. We had a higher number of those visas available since the system was created <clears throat> in 1990 with more than double the numbers typically available. So that's 140,000 additional for a total of 280,000. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I, I won't get into too much detail of how that came about. It had to do with the pandemic and, um, and temporary consular closures and the way the statute is constructed. But suffice it to say, uh, USCIS and our partners at the Department of State rose to the challenge and utilized all of these uh, green card numbers without wasting any of them. Um, and we're thrilled to welcome so many new lawful permanent residents, many uh, from India, and many of whom had waited years for this opportunity. Um, and I would emphasize that USCIS and our partners at, at state are committed to using all the available employment-based visas uh, in this fiscal year, as we are every year. Uh, the preliminary estimate for this year, again, is more than usual. Instead of 140,000, it's going to be close to 200,000. Um, and I'm glad to report that, you know, as of halfway through this fiscal year, as of the end of March, um, the, the two agencies had used well over half the available visas. So, uh, we're well on track um, to once again utilizing all available numbers. Uh, I want to close by saying that, you know, despite these successes, our work hasn't stopped. Uh, we want to continue always to build on this progress. And so a couple of things coming up that I, I think are of interest to this community. Uh, we're continuing to implement premium processing. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, we've removed the requirement to submit biometrics for applicants for changes and extensions of non-immigrant status including spouses of H-1B and other non-immigrant workers. Uh, we're, we're well into the process of simplifying several major forms, including applications for employment authorization, adjustment of status, and ultimately naturalization. Um, and, uh, and I, of course, want to emphasize that we have a whole of agency approach from the top down uh, to continue reducing backlogs and processing times across the board. Uh, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to give that overview. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to uh, uh, pass the mic to uh, the Chief of Staff for the State Department's Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs, 
Richie Ballack. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, so nice to see everyone here. Uh, we've uh, compiled questions um, from many of you, some with individual names, some are a compilation of questions we receive from many, many people. Um, and so I think we'll start first with Doug um, at USCIS. Uh, many of you inquired, what plans does USCIS have to help H4 and other dependents who are aging out of their immigration status? Uh, thanks so much, Jeff. So uh, I, I want to answer that in two parts. So first is what we've already done, and then uh, what's ahead. So uh, recently, USCIS issued guidance in our policy manual to clarify when an immigrant visa becomes available for purpose of calculating the Child Status Protection Act uh, age in certain situations. The Child Status Protection Act, also known as CSPA, or some call it CISPA. Um, I'm going to go with CISPA. Uh, so uh, the, the details are kind of... Um, complicated, but the bottom line is that uh, um, the CISPA protects uh, certain child non-citizens from losing their eligibility for immigrant visas and ultimately adjustment of status and their potential uh, to and their ability to remain lawfully in the United States um, at the moment they turn 21 and otherwise age out of the status derived from their parents. Um, so previously, uh, uh, the age was locked um, at, at a uh, later date. Uh, under this new policy, uh, it's locked in at an earlier date. Um, and because it's common for several months to elapse between the date for filing and the visa bullet and then the final action date, in some cases, this period can last years. This new guidance will help ensure that those who uh, previously would have aged out between those two dates will now have their age locked in as of the earlier date for filing. And, uh, and that's going to be true going forward as well. Um, so uh, we were glad to make that, um, that policy update. We're hoping it helps a lot of people, uh, both, uh, you know, who were previously in the situation and, and, and would have otherwise in the future. Uh, but we're not finished. Um, we also have a uh, rulemaking coming up that we'll talk about, I hope, uh, in more detail soon, um, called our Adjustment of Status uh, Proposed Rule. Um, and we've said publicly that, among many other provisions, uh, this proposed rule is slated to include um, a provision to authorize uh, employment authorization for certain derivative beneficiaries waiting for immigrant visa availability when they present compelling circumstances. So stay tuned for more details on that. Super, thanks for that, Doug. Uh, for Julie uh, in Consular Affairs, this is a question from Sahil in Herndon and Satish in Atlanta. Can you provide us with an update on the timeline for the domestic visa revalidation pilot program and clarify the eligibility criteria for applicants? Sure, thank you. As I said, we are very, very excited about this domestic renewal program. And uh, this will, uh, for those who are living and working in the United States, take away a lot of the uncertainty of traveling back overseas for a visa application. Uh, at the same time, it will allow our consular sections overseas to uh, free up a lot of space that would have been taken by those appointments and, uh, and focus on other high demand areas. So we're very excited. It's gonna be uh, a real game changer for all of us. We are on track to start that pilot this year. Indians will be uh, included in that. And we believe that about a month before we launch the program this year, there'll be a notice in the Federal Register. So please stay tuned for that. That will lay out the eligibility criteria. Wonderful. For back to Doug at USCIS, um, we've received numerous questions on when will premium processing start for employment authorization documents, EADs, including for H-4 spouses? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, again, I wanna uh, review where we are and where we're headed. So uh, just a couple of years ago, Congress directed USCIS to make uh, premium processing available to more filers um, so specifically, uh, that includes um, uh, petitions for permanent residency for multinational executives and managers, which we uh, accomplished back in January. Also, that same I-140 form for uh, advanced degree professionals or those with exceptional ability seeking a national interest waiver. Uh, that was also done as of January. Uh, and uh, we've also expanded premium processing to work permit applications, the I-765, for F1 students on optional practical training. That's done as of April. Uh, we've announced that um, the I-539, which is a change or extension of non-immigrant status for certain student and exchange visitors is coming very soon this summer. Um, and as Congress directed, we're working on plans to further expand premium processing 
for other filers uh, uh, with work permits or changes or extensions of uh, non-immigrant status. I want to emphasize Congress uh, gave us uh, a complementary directive as well, which is as we're expanding our workforce uh, and expanding uh, premium processing, um, which is basically faster processing in exchange for a premium fee, we also have to adhere to the legislative requirement that any of this expansion doesn't result in increasing processing times uh, for uh, immigration service requests not designated for premium processing. So um, it can't be zero sum. Uh, we, we have to make sure that at the same time we're expanding premium service that um, the regular lanes aren't going more slowly. Um, so that's why, uh, it's one of the reasons why we have to do these things uh, you know, in a stepwise fashion. I also wanna emphasize for those uh, watching who were curious about this question that it's already the case right now that when a, a premium H-1B I-129 petition is filed for a principal worker, uh, concurrently with one or more I-539s or I-765s for dependents, um, the officer will review all those filings at the same time, meaning they'll, on the premium time frame, adjudicate the I-129 and then turn to the I-539 uh, and then turn to the I-765 all in one sitting. Super, thanks for that, Doug. Um, over to Nancy in the Bureau of South and Central of Asian Affairs. We hear that the U.S.-India relationship is one of the most important in the 21st century from President Biden. However, Indian Americans and our families overseas continue to be impacted by ongoing visa backlogs and caps to H-1B and green cards, which disproportionately affect India due to our large population size. We are happy to hear that President Biden will host Prime Minister Modi for an official state visit in June. What else can we expect from the visit? And will visas be an area of discussion? Thanks so much for the question. And let me just start by saying and reiterating what I hope you've heard from all of us today is that reducing the wait times in India remains a top priority for all of us. We are committed to reducing them. Um, and to that end, as I think you've heard, we have expanded uh, significantly the resources dedicated to doing so. And we're committed to getting our staff the tools, the resources, and the support they need to bring down even further the wait times. We are really excited to be hosting Prime Minister Modi in June here in Washington. This is really going to be a great opportunity for our two leaders to underscore the deep ties between our two countries and between our peoples. They will be reviewing our growing trade, investment, and defense partnership. We also expect that they're going to discuss uh, new areas of cooperation as we work together to face global challenges like global health, like uh, climate change, clean energy technology, and food security. Underpinning all of these issues, however, is our shared investment in our people-to-people -people ties, whether that is promoting educational exchanges or investing in our workforce development. And certainly visas are a part of that conversation. It's great to hear, Nancy. For Julie, um, from an immigrant visa petitioner in India, the Mumbai consulate issued many visitor visas in the month of February, but a mere fraction of that for immigrant visas. If the consulate can accommodate more appointments for visitor visas, why not for immigrants, especially U.S. citizens' immediate relatives? What is the current processing time for a spousal visa? Yes, thank you for that. I think the short answer is that it takes far shorter to get an immigrant visa than a non-immigrant visa. Uh, and that's why you see that disparity. So right now, it takes six weeks or so for a uh, fully documented immigrant visa application, like a spouse, to then be seen in Mumbai and receive a visa uh, at an interview there. So actually, it's moving very, very quickly. This year already, we've done uh, almost double the number of immigrant visas uh, in Mumbai that we've done, that we did the previous year. Uh, immigrant visas, by the way, will always be very, very important to us. We have a congressional mandate to concentrate on immigrant visas, and so we will always give priority to these visas. It's great to hear, Julie. Over to Doug. Many of you who have pending applications for green cards have asked, why are the wait times for employment-based green cards so long? Yes, that is, that is the question. Um, and uh, I, I want to make sure we distinguish between statutory wait times and processing wait times. Um, so processing wait times, as we talked about earlier, uh, have been longer uh, than anybody wants uh, in, for many case types. 
but we're moving in the right direction. Um, the, the time it takes for uh, USCIS to process an application or a petition uh, is under our control uh, and we're moving in the right direction. Um, uh, for example, for applications for permanent residency, the I-485, um, the director has established a goal of basically six months of a uh, uh, of backlog or processing time uh, by the end of this fiscal year. We're well on our way. Processing times for employment-based uh, uh, permanent residency are, are in good shape. Uh, the main problem, though, is statutory uh, backlogs. Uh, is the main problem is that Congress created overlapping bottlenecks in 1990, over 30 years ago, and hasn't updated the law since then. Uh, as many of you know, uh, forgive me for uh, being redundant, but I, I think it bears repeating, uh, the annual limit established by Congress on family-sponsored preference green cards is 226000 for the whole world. Uh, the annual limit on employment-based green cards is 140000 for the whole world. And the per-country limit on top of that is set at 7% of the total annual family-sponsored and employment-based preference, preference limits. That means 25,620. So that's why individuals from India, China, Mexico, and the Philippines typically face such longer wait times than individuals from other countries. There is demand for so many more than 25,620 uh, green card numbers, both family and employment-based, each and every year. Uh, and unfortunately, only Congress can change these annual limits. So our job, and I'm sure my State Department colleagues uh, would, would say the same, is to do everything we can within these constraints to ensure that when those green card numbers are available, uh, we make sure that they are utilized each and every year. Thanks, Doug. Um, similarly, we received many questions that add up to this. Uh, why does visa retrogression happen? If you could explain that to us. Yes, uh, this is a question that certainly uh, makes many experts head spin, myself included. Um, we've uh, we put forward uh, what I hope is a useful uh, and pretty comprehensive resource trying to explain uh, uh, you know retrogression and the mechanics of it, uh, which we've linked, uh, I believe, in the, the the description of this event online. Um, but suffice it to say, for now. Uh, it's about supply and demand. So uh, Congress has constrained supply, demand continues to go up, not just from India, but all over the world. Uh, when the amount of demand for a particular green card category or a country within a category exceeds the supply of numbers available, um, then that category and country are considered oversubscribed uh, and uh, the State Department applies a cutoff date um, in the visa bulletin. And that's to ensure that visa use remains within those annual limits as well as the category and per country limits, an order of consideration is established by Congress. Um, retrogression simply means that due to the high demand for visas exceeding the statutory limits, uh, visas are not available to all non-citizens who want them, even if they've already filed an application for adjustment of status um, or otherwise for permanent residency. Now, I, I wanna emphasize um, for the sake of, uh, of, of data transparency and policy transparency, we plan to continue improving the accuracy and comprehensiveness of our data on employment-based uh, uh, adjustment of status applications. And our goal is to resume publishing regular regular inventory reports. So uh, like I said before, we, we've already um, tried to be as transparent as we can in describing how this, uh, this convoluted system works. Um, we want to back that up with, uh, with raw data so that effective in individuals can um, can understand uh, you know, how this process works and, and where the numbers come from. I also wanna emphasize that uh, even when there is retrogression, uh, uh, there are, there are uh, enduring uh, benefits. So somebody who had the opportunity to file uh, for adjustment of status through, through our agency, um, but who uh, then sees their uh, cutoff date retrogress, they're still able to seek certain benefits. Um, uh, they can apply for employment authorization, uh, uh, which is not tied to a particular employer. They can apply for advanced parole, authorizing travel outside the United States. Um, uh, once that uh, adjustment of status application has been pending for 180 days or more, they can port the underlying job opportunity uh, to a new employer. Um, and uh, uh, depending on the facts of the case, children who have also applied for adjustment of status might not age out. Um, and uh, and that individual is generally considered to be in a period of uh, authorized stay 
while the uh, application was pending. So um, retrogression is something I think that uh, it can be extremely frustrating. No one under um, you know underappreciate that. Um, but uh, but there are also advantages of, of, of having the opportunity to file uh, for adjustment of status in the first place. Great, very complicated, but thank you for explaining that, Doug. Over to Julie. Um, many participants submitted questions regarding 221G status. The question is, why has my application been in 221G for so long? How do I get a faster response on 221G additional administrative processing? What happens to families when one member is caught in administrative processing status? Yes, thank you very much for this question. Um, for those who aren't aware, 221G is the shorthand for a visa application that is delayed for some reason, that there's some additional processing that's needed. And I believe that this uh, question gets to the other version of 221G, which is administrative processing status, um, as you said. So. Uh, First and foremost, national security is our top priority whenever adjudicating visa cases. And every prospective traveler goes through a process of uh, extensive security screening. In some cases, relatively few, a traveler will need additional time uh, to be assessed uh, for eligible for a visa. And that varies on the amount of time that that takes. The good news is that last year and going forward, administrative processing has taken far, far shorter and affects far fewer people uh, than has in the past. So if you have a case that's been pending for, for many months, we recommend you get back in touch with the embassy or consulate where that was adjudicated, ask them for a status update on that. And I hope you have good news soon. Let's hope. Um, for Nancy, from an applicant in Kolkata, I've been trying to schedule an app appointment. I'm planning to come to the U.S. for academic purposes. I've paid all fees and have all necessary documents, but I'm unable to schedule an appointment. Other cities in India have no consular appointments. Could you please shed some clarity on this issue? When will consular appointments for students be available? And what are the factors that prompt consular appointments to become available? Thanks for the question and uh, very much appreciate the anxiety that college application processes present for all of us and uh, adding visa anxiety on top of it is no fun, I know. Um, the good news is that our mission to India will be ramping up quite considerably its efforts to support uh, student visa processing this summer in anticipation for the new academic year. And in fact, just this past weekend, the mission uh, released almost 75,000 appointments, wow. student visa appointments, from the embassy and our consulates. So that's the good news. Um, our mission will continue to do so. They are opening another batch. They will be opening another batch uh, of large numbers of student visa appointments in just a few weeks for those who were not ready to book an appointment this past weekend. So that's the good news. We are very much looking forward to the start of the student visa year, and we are prepared for even more student applications this year than we had last year, as Julie mentioned earlier. The summer student rush, that's mm -hmm. great to hear. Over to Doug. In response to recent developments with the H-1B lottery, some people asked, how does USCIS conduct the H-1B registration process, and what can you do to curb potential fraud? Yes, this is a very timely question uh, because we're in H-1B cap season right now. Uh, and just uh, as a refresher, um, we talked just now uh, about how Congress in 1990 set caps on green cards, that is permanent residency. Uh, Congress also set caps on H-1Bs, uh, which are temporary uh, uh, work status. Um, 85,000 a year, by and large, some applicants uh, in the university and nonprofit space uh, don't have the cap applied to them, but by and large, we're talking about 85,000 a year and demand uh, uh, for years now has dramatically exceeded supply. So here again, um, we have these, uh, we have these um, statutory constraints. Uh, so uh, the way the agency has run for the last couple of years is uh, rather than having two, 300,000 uh, petitions be submitted, only 85,000 of which can ultimately be selected, um, we have a registration process that's fully online uh, where uh, an employer can uh, register for the person they wanna hire. And then if they get chosen in the lottery, 
um, then they can go forward and submit the full petition. Um, as we uh, 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 showed with some data a few weeks ago, um, the number of uh, employers registering uh, workers uh, has grown considerably uh, in this year compared to last year. Uh, and, and what has, uh, has been uh, raised some concerns is that a large number of, of those registrations were for beneficiaries with multiple eligible registrations, much more so than in previous years. Again, this has raised serious concerns that some may have tried to gain an unfair advantage by working together to submit multiple registrations on behalf of the same person. And this may have unfairly increased their chances of selection. I want to be very clear. We are committed to deterring and preventing abuse of this registration process and to ensuring that only those who follow the law are eligible to file an H-1B cap petition. We want to remind the public uh, that each time uh, a registration is submitted, the prospective uh, petitioner, that is the employer, is required to sign an attestation under penalty of perjury. Uh, that among other things, uh, they're not uh, 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 working with others to unfairly ish increase the chances of selection uh, uh, through this registration process. If USCIS finds that this attestation was violated, uh, we will find the registration uh, to be not properly submitted. Um, we may deny the petition, revoke a petition approval uh, uh, based on a false attestation. And furthermore, uh, USCIS may also refer the individual or entity who submitted a false attestation to appropriate federal law enforcement agencies for investigation and further action is appropriate. Let me emphasize, based on em uh, evidence from uh, last year's and this year's cap seasons, USCIS has already undertaken extensive fraud investigations, denied and revoked petitions accordingly, and is in the process of initiating law enforcement referrals for criminal prosecution. The H-1B program is an essential part of our nation's immigration system and our economy, and USCIS is committed to implementing the law and helping meet the ever-changing needs of the U.S. labor market. We're working on uh, an upcoming H-1B modernization rule that I hope we get a chance to talk about today in more detail. That rule will propose, among other improvements, bolstering the H-1B registration process to reduce the possibility of misuse and fraud in this H-1B registration system going forward. Super, that's great to hear, Doug. Um, over to Julie. From across India, there are many refused students who are waiting for slots to open up. When will more refusal slots open? Thank you. Um, going back to just student interviews in general, because student visa interviews are available for those who've been refused or, or not in most cases, and they're also available around the world. But for India-specific student visa cases, as Nancy said, the, the consulates and embassy opened up a huge, huge block this weekend. That will continue. Um, this summer is the busiest visa interview, uh, student visa interview period, I think that we've ever had in our history anywhere in the world. Um, so it, it's one of the biggest for sure, and, uh, and we're really excited about that. We want as many Indian students who want to come to the United States to study to come, and our embassy all the way down and the State Department are absolutely committed to that. So keep looking for those appointments. Mm -hmm. Great. For Doug. Um, what determines the validity period for H-1B visas? Thanks. Uh, that's a pretty uh, straightforward one compared <laughs> to some of the other questions. The answer is Congress. Uh, Congress established the validity period for H-1B visas, and uh, for better or for worse, that's not something left to the discretion of the executive branch. All right, that was maybe a softball. Here's a harder one. What determines the validity period of EADs and for advanced parole? Uh, great question. So uh, and we know that it's important to so many people, the ability to work, the ability to travel internationally. Uh, so the validity period of those work permits and of that advanced parole document is in fact a matter of executive branch regulation and policy. Uh, and uh, we are always working to improve our regulations and our policies um, to make the uh, uh, immigration system work better and to restore faith in it. Okay, to Julie, um, what are the current wait times for B1B2 renewal cases in Mission India? Yes, um, thank you. We've worked really hard to enact a policy uh, through which anyone who has re is renewing a visa has had a previous visa of any type can submit without an interview their case to be reapproved. 
And uh, that's what's happening for B1, B2s, which are tourist visas, as well as other visa types. So I'm very happy to say that there's almost uh, no wait time. Uh, it's just a matter of days to get that visa renewed. That's wonderful. Some good news. Um, over to Doug. We received interest from India and the U.S. regarding this question. What regulatory plans does USCIS have that will impact Indian nationals in the United States? Great question. Uh, there is a underappreciated website that I, I um, here to tell you is called reginfo.gov uh, that, uh, that has all the information I'm about to summarize. So we have very ambitious regulatory plans uh, for the next uh, you know year plus ahead of us. Um, the way this typically works, as many of you know, is uh, uh, the agency publishes a proposed rule. We solicit public from the, uh, uh, we, we submit uh, 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 this uh, to the federal register where anyone in the world can see it. We solicit comments from the public that could be people not only in the United States, but abroad. Um, and then we read, we do actually uh, look at every single comment uh, to guide us in uh, in crafting the final rule, uh, which then uh, becomes administrative law, um, and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, helps the system work better. So I want to highlight two uh, proposed rules that haven't been published yet, um, but are coming soon. Uh, one of them is uh, a rule to modernize the H-1B system, um, and uh, specifically, uh, we're planning uh, to issue a proposed rule that would revise regulations related to the employer-employee relationship and provide more flexibility for uh, entrepreneurs, um, some integrity measures uh, regarding uh, site visits, um, providing more flexibility on the employment start date listed on the petition in certain circumstances, addressing cap-gap issues with students, um, and uh, uh, like I said before, bolstering the H-1B registration process to reduce fraud and mis uh, misuse. Um, and, uh, and, and there's going to be many, many other provisions there um, to, uh, to modernize and, and strengthen the program. I also want to highlight a different but complementary uh, rulemaking that uh, we'll be proposing soon uh, called the Adjustment of Status Rule. Uh, and uh, among many other things, uh, uh, its intent is to reduce processing times, improve the quality of uh, inventory data that we provide to state and other uh, partner agencies, reduce the potential for visa retrogression, as we talked about before, and make sure we're promoting the efficient use of immediately available immigrant visas. Uh, this is the rule that, as I said earlier, uh, would also propose to um, uh, uh, help uh, with, uh, with the age out situation for individuals at risk of losing their immigration status uh, at the age of 20. So that's just two. We also have uh, rules coming out on citizenship and naturalization, which is incredibly important uh, for individuals who've been here uh, 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 for a sufficient amount of time and want to take that, uh, that step that we welcome so much to become a, a, a U.S. citizen uh, whenever they're eligible to do so. Um, so that's just a taste of, uh, of uh, many regulations that are in the hopper and coming soon. Our rulemakers hard at work. Great to hear, Doug. Um, another question from an employee in the United States. What options do laid off workers have to stay in the U.S. while searching for a new job? That is clearly a very timely and, and, and very important question that we take very seriously, um, especially as uh, layoffs continue to royal the technology industry where so many uh, Indian nationals uh, are employed. Um, so I want to be very clear because uh, there's been a lot of reporting uh, that has been unintentionally uh, misleading. When a, when a worker is laid off, a worker with non-immigrant status, they may not be aware of their options and may in some instances wrongly assume that they have no option but to leave the country within 60 days. Uh, in fact, when a non-immigrant worker's employment is terminated, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, um, they typically may take one of the following actions, if they're eligible, uh, to remain in a period of authorized stay in the United States. Um, you can file an application for a change of non-immigrant status, file an application for adjustment of status, you can file an application for a compelling circumstances employment authorization document, or ideally, you can be the beneficiary of a petition to change employers. If any of these actions occurs, and again, I'm talking about filing the application, not necessarily waiting on us to adjudicate it. If, if any of those applications are filed within that 60-day grace period, then uh, the person's 
period of authorized stay in the U.S. can exceed 60 days, even if they lose their previous non-immigrant status. Um, so uh, so I, I think this is so important. We, we have a website uh, that you can easily Google uh, called Options for Non-Immigrant Workers Following Termination of Employment. It gets into a lot more details, I think, resolves a lot of questions that people had, uh, you know, who were anxious during that 60 day grace period, clarifying things like, you know, am I allowed to search for a job uh, when I'm on a, a you know, a, tra a, a temporary a tourist or business travel visa? The answer is yes. Um, you know, will, uh, will my change of status application uh, be prioritized if I find a new employer uh, who's willing to uh, petition for me with premium process service? Um, yes. Uh, so, you know, it's, I, I don't want to sit here and say that, you know, it's not stressful or anxiety inducing and really, really devastating to be uh, laid off in the best of circumstances, uh, let alone when one's immigration status is at stake. But, um, but I do hope that people consult this resource uh, and, and, and proceed with confidence um, that there, uh, there is in fact no hard and fast rule that says, if you don't get a new job within 60 days, you have to leave the country. Uh, there are many, many options available um, to stop that clock um, so that people, um, you know, as long as they've taken the appropriate action within 60 days, they can uh, while they can do that job search. Great to hear so many options, Doug. Um, another sort of related question. Um, what immigration status options do skilled workers have other than the H-1B? Uh, I'm glad people ask that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's increasingly important. Um, and uh, especially under this administration where we've tried to really clarify and, uh, uh, and, uh, and promote knowledge about all the different pathways, uh, particularly for skilled workers uh, that are available under our existing laws. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about all of the constraints that we're under given laws passed over 30 years ago. Um, but we don't want to underappreciate the fact that there are, uh, you know, many pathways uh, to uh, to work in this country, um, and we want to make sure that uh, everybody understands what they're eligible for and what their options are. Um, so um, we uh, we published USCIS published two online resources relatively recently. One of them is a hopefully comprehensive menu of uh, of uh, temporary and permanent pathways for non-citizens to work in the United States in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields. Uh, and then we have a, a complementary resource uh, for those uh, who are entrepreneurs or would like to be entrepreneurs uh, going over all of the options uh, uh, for them. And there are there are there is more than one option in both cases. Um, so for example, I wanna note some important policy updates the USCIS made last year. Um, number one, uh, you may be an individual with an advanced degree in one of the STEM fields. Uh, or an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, there is a uh, green card pathway available called the EB2 with national interest waiver. Uh, it's, a, it's an important one uh, because um, uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, various uh, efficiencies, especially now that um, these national interest waiver uh, applications are available through premium processing. Um, uh, we've made it clearer than it ever been before uh, who's eligible for that pathway. For example, those with a degree in a STEM field and a critical or emerging technology that advances U.S. competitiveness and national security. And yes, we do break down what those fields are. Um, it helps to have a letter of support from a government agency or a national lab, uh, uh, or alternatively, to be a startup founder with demonstrated investment or revenue growth. Um, there's, a, there's another uh, uh, pathway, the O-1 uh, visa, which people may be familiar with, um, for people with extraordinary ability in science and other fields. Uh, we put out very, very detailed guidance on uh, how someone would demonstrate their eligibility for, uh, for that visa. Um, for example, academic articles in highly ranked journals, serving as a peer reviewer for other researchers, uh, or perhaps owning a stake in a growing startup. Uh, I want to give credit where credit is due uh, with the Department of State which has also made some important changes to its own J-1 visa program for exchange visitors. Um, for example, uh, for undergraduate and graduate students in STEM fields uh, on the J-1 visa, they now have the ability to stay for 36 months uh, for postgraduate on the job training instead of 18 months as previously. And then something I think that's very exciting uh, is there's a, um, a J-1 pathway called the Early Career STEM Research Initiative, 
that is facilitating exchange visitors coming to the United States to engage in STEM research with host organizations, including companies, large companies or small companies. Um, I want to emphasize we're not altering uh, who's eligible, uh, but we are making it so much clearer. Um, uh, and, uh, and what we've expected is that uh, the more people who understand what they're eligible for uh, uh, and who have that newfound clarity about what evidence to present, um, the greater the pipeline of, uh, of global STEM talent, including from India, uh, that will be applying and ultimately getting uh, you know, approved if eligible. And that is so critical for our nation's health, security, and economic prosperity. And just a sneak preview, um, I think, you know, since we uh, uh, put out these new policies over a year ago, uh, uh, the number of applications has gone up and we'll be publishing uh, data uh, to show that uh, very soon. Knowledge is definitely power. Thanks, Doug. Um, or to Julie, uh, when can we expect to see domestic renewals as an option for H-1B and L visa holders? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the domestic renewal program will start with a pilot this year. Uh, H's and L's are both visa types that are included um, either in the pilot or long term are, uh, are allowed by regulation to be included with the domestic renewal program. We're really excited as we broaden the scope of this program in 2024 to see the impact it's going to have. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Indian citizens will benefit uh, very much from this program since uh, Indian nationals hold the highest number of H1 and H4 visas. So um, we really hope that 2024, we will all collectively see a huge impact from this program. Thank you all so much. Um, those were amazing questions. And now I'll pass it back to Nancy Jackson for our close. Great. Thank you, Richa. And And a huge thank you to my colleagues, both Doug and Julie, for spending so much time with us today and answering all your questions. I also want to thank all of you for your excellent questions during today's town hall. As mentioned throughout this at last hour, our government remains committed to deepening the U.S.-India strategic partnership, growing our people-to-people -people ties, and addressing your concerns. I understand the past year has been extremely difficult for many of you on this call as we have emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic and our government addressed the unprecedented amount of pent up demand for travel between our two nations. I hope what we discussed today and the steady reduction of wait times demonstrates that we are truly committed to addressing your concerns and facilitating travel. Continued progress on reducing wait times is something that President Biden, Ambassador Garcetti, Assistant Secretary Liu, Consular Assistant Secretary Rena Bitter, Julie, Doug, and myself, we are all truly focused on, and we appreciate your partnership. Please remain in touch with us through our Bureau of Consular Affairs and our diplomatic missions throughout India with any additional questions or concerns that you might have. Thank you again for taking the time to tune in today.